female style. We have pulled this panel together and brought new people in immediately because we just knew that we needed to have as many voices present as possible. I'm Jessica Swaden, founder of Synchronicity Earth, an organization that supports global biodiversity challenges across the world. Um, we're going to kick off first with a film um, with, uh, from the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative, and I'd like to have Belen Pais introduce it for us, and then we'll, we'll get into our discussion in a moment. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Belen Paez, and I'm from Ecuador. I've been working over the last 25 years in the Amazon region, and I run um, an organization that is called Fundación Pachamama, sister organization of the Pachamama Alliance. Um, we have come here with a delegation of 20 in indigenous peoples for, from all over the Amazon, different initiatives, different perspectives, but we all are here in, uh, coming from the front lines, defending their, their territories over there in order to have a space under the COP26 that we have been coming every year and every year as an Amazonic delegations to have more and more, um, uh, give more uh, like um, um, elements to have more awareness and to have more commitments, not by just by the governments, but from every civil society citizen that will be more aware and um, close to the Amazon. We all need to be more close to the Amazon. We really believe that the Amazon ecosystems is related to the future, to the climate stability for all around the world. And this video is a beautiful video because it's the work that we have done over the last three years. We have been creating with the participation for, from over 35 indigenous nations around Peru and Ecuador, a vision for a common future for 2041 on what we want and what we know that can be possible that will be done in the Amazon in the next 10 years. So this is a provocation. This is a, um, a plan that we have put in place and, and uh, presented already to the governments and local governments and to the bilateral institutions. And this is uh, the time that um, I would like to share with you this um, future vision that is coming from the call from the sacred headwaters spirits and also from the call from our ancestors in the Amazon. Please enjoy. Let me paint you a picture of an inspiring future for our world. It's a future that began right here in the headwaters region of the Great Amazon River between Ecuador and Peru. The year is 2041. The age of extraction has finally given way to the age of buen vivir and a beautiful bioeconomy is thriving around the globe. I'm here looking back at how we protected this rainforest and in doing so, transformed the world. To reach this future, we had to start by facing our past. Thousands of years ago, my Amazonian ancestors already knew that the earth is alive and that this forest is its beating heart, something only recently discovered by science. And because they saw the world as alive and themselves as an integral part of her, they lived by an ethical code of harmonious coexistence and reciprocity with nature, known as buen vivir. But then the conquest happened and the wisdom of Buen Vivir was all but lost. The world I was born into had been shaped by Spanish invaders who cast aside the principled aspirations of Buen Vivir and promised progress through plunder. For centuries, the many disparate indigenous nations of the Amazon and their living forests were pillaged and destroyed in the name of progress, development, and profit. We were reduced to fighting over artificial borders brought by colonization and the newborn republics. People were taught to see our nation's wealth only in what could be extracted from the ground, first gold and later minerals, timber, and black gold. But in the year 2019, the same year millions of acres of rainforest were burned down, the UN-sponsored science panel for the Amazon issued a severe warning that the Amazon was reaching a tipping point that would trigger a massive dieback on the entire forest with catastrophic impacts for the future of humanity. It was finally accepted as scientific fact 
that the Amazon forest acts as a beating heart of the Earth, circulating rain around the planet and regulating its temperature. The scientists were starting to understand what we've been saying all along. They joined us in acknowledging that at least 80% of this rainforest must be left standing to prevent the collapse of the entire planet's circulatory system. Though the forest was burning, the spirit of our people burned brighter. Once divided, the people of the region now united to issue the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Declaration. Put forth by the largest alliance of indigenous Amazonian nations ever assembled, their vision was ambitious and inspiring. To have these highly biodiverse headwaters of the Amazon River Basin recognized as permanently protected bioregion, a territory demarcated not by current political borders, but by its natural and cultural boundaries. The declaration called for a ban on industrial scale resource extraction and instead mapped pathways for a just transition to a new regenerative bioeconomy. The formation of the initiative was an unprecedented step towards indigenous rights and stewardship. But it was just the beginning of a long journey. Before we could catch our breath from the fires of 2019, COVID erupted, killing millions around the globe. The pandemic helped expose inequity and fragility of the current economic system. People everywhere were fed up and ready for something different. But exactly what that was, was still not clear. And like heeding a call, 2021 brought global shifts in the right direction. The U.S. rejoined the rest of the world in the Paris Climate Agreement, and even China committed to zero carbon emissions by 2060. Then, the Sacred Headwaters Alliance unveiled its bioregional plan, which laid out in detail the solution pathways that would protect the region and transform its economy to prioritize the well-being of ecosystems and communities. From local food sovereignty to green transportation and renewable energy, the plan inspired people from all sectors to innovate a new type of progress guided by the ancient Buen Vivir philosophy. There was much to do. First, we identified that the GDP is a flawed measure of progress that incentivizes destruction. So in 2022, inspired by Bhutan and New Zealand's happiness index, we created an alternative metric the Buen Vivir Index, BVI, a new set of ecological and social indicators to measure the true wealth and health of nations. Soon after, a significant number of governments, including Peru and Ecuador, signed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty to phase out the production of fossil fuels by 2030. Ecuador and Peru agreed to permanently leave untapped fossil fuel reserves in the ground. In exchange, China and the IMF negotiated the largest ever debt forgiveness package. Oil revenues were no longer needed to pay interest on national debt. Established to support the bioregional plan, the Sacred Headwaters Fund received over a billion dollars in funding from around the world in its first three years. Standing forest work programs aimed at halting deforestation were launched including enforcement and restoration initiatives transitioning thousands of oil workers to new bioeconomy jobs with equal pay. The newly formed Indigenous Youth Corps flexed their tech sovereignty by deploying new apps for monitoring the territory and cataloging its biodiversity, the highest levels registered anywhere on Earth. By 2024, ecological restoration made up the largest number of new jobs. That same year, the Peruvian government finally recognized indigenous people's ancestral land claims to the Sacred Headwaters region, guaranteeing protection of more than 22 million acres. Led by Peruvian youth in 2025, social movements voted for Buen Vivir candidates and the constitutional amendment that recognizes the rights of nature was passed. The Buen Vivir movement was transforming worldviews, priorities, and policies. That's how, in 2026, Ecuador and Peru officially agreed to establish the protected Sacred Headwaters Bioregional Sanctuary, governed by a plurinational council that included the 30 indigenous nations from the region. A shift in culture was palpable as the heart of the world pride movement spread from the Andes to Brazil. The Forest Wisdom University opened in 2027 with just 10 faculty and 38 students. By 2028, BVI was adopted as a key policy by the progressive political parties in Ecuador and Peru. 
The Green Frontiers Program invested in municipal and provincial governments of small Amazon frontier towns to implement eco-urban redesign plans. All done by planners who graduated from the new School of Applied Bio Principles at the Forest Wisdom University. Ecuador and Peru finally reached their goal of 100% renewable energy in 2031. That was the first year no fossil fuels were extracted or imported to run the country. With a rising BVI, there was little argument for returning to the extractive economy of the past. The bioregional movement continued to sweep through the continent and by the end of the 2030s had begun to transform the rest of the globe. Today, governance, local decision-making, and economic activity everywhere is being reorganized around the goal of maintaining the health and integrity of ecosystems, communities, and families. Inspired by what started here, the world has come to study with elders and their young apprentices at the Forest Wisdom University. Over 150,000 students are enrolled, studying everything from bioregional planning and regenerative economics to ethnophilosophy, integrative medicine, and agroforestry. Looking back from 2041, I am so grateful for the brave souls who had the courage to look into their turbulent past so they could create a harmonious future. Thank you for sharing that beautiful film with us um, as a plug for the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative and, and to any funders in the room. It is by far and away one of the most important projects that I've seen come online because it's exceptionally diverse, inclusive, but it's also looking at this bioregional plan, which is going to be an essential mechanism for how we get some of that big chunky funding that we've been hearing about coming in as pledges onto the ground. So give away. <laughs> um, but thank you all for being here. We've, we've switched up again. We were, we we're never moving panel here today, <laughs> but that's what biodiversity is all about. We are a weave in a fabric of all life. <laughs> and we, uh, we're stronger when we're together. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I just, you know, for me to have a conversation around biodiversity in a climate cop is, well, it's about time, right? I think that these two universes have been separate for too long and of course they are absolutely interrelated. Today we're going to talk about the interconnections between gender, health, sustainable development, climate resilience, and biodiversity. We have a diverse panel and we're all working in biodiversity in different kinds of ways but of course you know the fabric of life that is biodiversity, that weave of the multitude of species and ecosystems that are working together that cr they come together to create the, light, the, the ability for us to sus they sustain the conditions for us to be here on Earth. And it is disappearing at a fast and furious rate because of the human hand in industrial agriculture, in technology, oil, and the extractives, uh, in fashion. We've heard about that as well today. Um, and all of these are contributing to climate change. But equally, the other side of that coin is the health and, ha and habitat of our species and our ecosystems, which are also you know, so much of the solution to the climate crisis. Um, you know, in my lifetime, we've lost over 50% of life on Earth, which for me is why I got into this space. I cannot accept the fact that that's how we are existing as human beings, that that's OK. We have to do better than that. Um, and we have to move away from um, this extractive industries and start thinking about how we recreate, refabricate life on Earth and, and give it the due respect that it, that it deserves. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to just sort of do, have everybody quickly introduce themselves, tell us where they come from, give us your names, a little bit of background of, of who you are and how you're working with biodiversity. And so I'm going to start on my left with Hasanti. Um, I'm Hasanti Disanayaka. Uh, we have very long names. I've got more <laughs> names, so this is the shortest possible that I can introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm Director General, Ocean Affairs, Environment and Climate Change at the Foreign Ministry of Sri Lanka. 
Um, and previously, uh, I was the ambassador of Sri Lanka to Vietnam. I'm a career diplomat uh, with about 25 years of service. Um, and uh, before joining the foreign service, I have worked in the banking sector, in, um, uh, uh, have done computer programming, worked with international organizations, and above all, I have been an environmental activist. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, while I was at the university, I was with an environmental NGO coalition, where I was the coordinator, uh, where we uh, did the report, citizens report for Rio. So uh, that's my background, and I come from a family where we care a lot about the environment. So um, finally, when I got this position at the foreign ministry, I was very happy. And at the ministry in foreign affairs, nobody else seems to be understanding what I'm doing. In a way, it's good, because I, I can create situations. And, um, and quite interestingly enough, it's a new division. So I work with um, NGOs. Um, private sector, government officials, and uh, I also uh, find it very interesting because we also write speeches for the president, prime minister, edit uh, speeches of the minister of environment. So what I do is I get across my messages to that. <laughs> and uh, I wait to see whether they edit. <laughs> and sometimes it gets edited, but sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> So um, that's how Sri Lanka joined the No More New Coal Compact. Uh, in fact, we've, uh, our president has declared that we won't be building any more coal power plants in Sri Lanka, um, uh, like uh, I think around March 2021. <coughs> so that was it. But I got it to his speeches, and then uh, I got it to his speech as, at the high level uh, uh, high-level energy event on the sidelines of UNGA, and now it's it's progressing. So I keep on adding. Uh, so um, so for the first time working for the government, um, I'm very happy that I can make things move just by myself. So um, so after 25 years, I'm enjoying my job, um, <laughs> and uh, I went to COP25. I was lost. Uh, at the beginning, but I made a lot of connections and uh, I have been doing quite a lot of work using those connections since then. And uh, in 2019, um, no, in 2018, Sri Lanka, under the Commonwealth Blue Charter, uh, we joined uh, to champion the action group on mangroves. Uh, and uh, then also in, this, uh, in 2019, we launched uh, uh, Colombo Declaration on Sustainable Nitrogen Management. Basically, that is to uh, consider halving um, nitrogen by f nitrogen waste by 50% by 2030. Um, so, uh, so that's the main project that I'm supporting. These are not our ministry projects. These are of mini projects of Ministry of Environment. But I'm supporting them to get it uh, to the global level. Um, and then I also do quite a lot of work related to oceans. So, um, and um, so that's <laughs> the kind of a basic introduction about me. Thank wow, you. thank you very much. That's, a, that's a impressive. Thank you for being here with us today. Nicole, do you want to tell us yeah. a little bit about yourself? <laughs> sure. So I don't work for the government. I'm from Brazil. Yeah. It's very hard to work for the government on <laughs> biodiversity <laughs> these days. So very exciting also to see yeah. uh, the movie um, there about the Amazon. Of course, we have many uh, indigenous representatives uh, here at the COP. And Brazil has the second largest delegation after the fossil fuel industry. Great. Oh. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, that's, that's so we almost, we almost won, but the that's industry awesome. is still uh, winning. The, and this is a 500 people around, so, so just for you to know. Um, and so I'm uh, Dr. Nicole de Paula. I say doctor because I'm, my background is in international affairs, but I work a lot with public health experts, so I'm kind of fake doctor. So I, I say doctor because, you know, it, it kind of helps during this uh, thing. So I'm from Brazil, but I'm based in Germany, uh, where I am the founder of the Women Leaders for Planetary Health. So really working at this connection between public health, uh, sustainability uh, and gender. 
So I'm also very, very honored to be here. So it feels so special. I finally can see so many members and of course, uh, founder and co-founder of Bianca of the She Changed Climate. I'm part of the steering committee there. So it's so impressive to see how, you know, fun calls and Zoom calls and here we are. So it proves that this network and, and all our networks here can make a difference. And I think we were pushing for this thing. So I'm very proud of what we achieved and congratulations uh, specifically for Bianca and Antoinette as well. Uh, for being here, so thank you uh, so thank much. Thank you for being here with us. Right, Prudence, thank introduce you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. So I hold no special portfolio, and uh, my name is Prudence, and I'm a member of the Rallying Cry Initiative. Um, is introduced in the previous panel I was speaking. I'm also Chief Financial Officer of an organization in Zambia that does work uh, with smallholder farmers, many women uh, from the rural setup. And if you come to Zambia and you ask a description of what Komako is all about, they'll tell you that is that company that sells food with an elephant on it, because that's where Komako was um, initiated from. So the background of Komako is that um, our founder had a passion to serve elephants, wildlife, but what we realized is you can't do it in isolation, and that's what we stand up for. Um, what's Quite interesting is I'm a finance expert. I've been a banker before and I'm an accountant. And here I am um, engaging with many women on biodiversity. That's how diverse women are. And that's what each and every woman in this room should take up. Mm. We are the change makers. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. <laughs> I I won't comment yet. I'll keep going. Uh, Belen, you introduced yourself before. Do you want to say anything right now? I would like to add something. Yeah. Okay. That, um, yes, I'm, I'm an ecology by formation. And um, I used to study the pink dolphins and giant otters mm -hmm. in the Amazon basin. And now I'm also part of the scientific <laughs> panel on, on, for the Amazon for United Nations, working with Professor Carlos Nobre from Brazil. And um, my, my, my part of the, session, the, the chapters were about the Pan American Amazon vision for the next years, working from biodiversity perspective and women. So I'm really passionate to work mm. uh, in Ecuador with the maternal health care uh, programs in the Amazon with indigenous women that are related with the biodiversity and the seeds from their garden. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here sharing with you today. Thank you, Bianca, and everyone to have this space for women voices. Wonderful, and uh, we're delighted that you happened to join our panel because you yeah. belong here. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, <laughs> <laughs> lovely to see you here, Judy. <laughs> yeah. You your oh yeah, uh, I'm Judy Murithi. I come from all the way from Kenya. Uh, my background, I have a legal background. Um, how I'm involved with biodiversity and the environmental sector, climate change is that um, I worked with. I work with with the law to work, okay, working in the law to work with the environment and climate change. In that, I have tried, okay, I try to incorporate the law on, on bringing up policies that are, that are for the environment. And I'm currently um, engaged in different projects. Um, I've recently finished a project on wildlife and wildlife, wildlife crime, where we, uh, well, where I'm actively uh, taking part in mapping uh, the, the crimes or the court cases in around the country and find, finding to see how we can improve the law to reduce uh, destruction and environmental crimes. We have the wildlife crimes, the forestry crimes, and in that I'm also uh, helping with some organizations. Like right now we are in another organization called Africa Network for Animal Welfare, where we're trying to come up with a UNIA resolution to improve the, the, the working conditions for working animals and domestic animals. And I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. And I look forward for a very good, favorable conversation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just want to unpack a little bit around you know, how we all work with biodiversity, what that actually means. And I think I'd like to start with you, Nicole, and thinking about planetary health. You know, we've just, we're still emerging out of the COVID crisis, we hope. Um, we're being careful. Um, you know, what, can you talk to us a little bit about you know the relationship between biodiversity and global health? Sure. Um, I think there is one good thing about this pandemic. It's opening our eyes for these connections. We, we are 
experiencing so many crises and now of course women were disproportionately impacted during this lockdowns and we're going to talk about this but one of the things is um, everything we are living in this time that we call the anthropocene right so it's like human made transformations of our nature in general and so everything is changing not only climate is changing and so we with the pandemic we see that uh, one of the things that i like to highlight is one of the real antidote against future pandemics is nature protection and one of the things that we are of course it was um, incredible what we achieved uh, finding uh, you know the minimum time it would get a vaccine would be four years uh, and then uh, because of this collective collaboration and investments we got uh, an important beginning of the solution, um, not for all countries. Let's uh, remember the vaccine inequity is an issue and of, of course a very important that we tend to forget. Um, but 70% uh, of diseases that we see, uh, the emerging diseases are zoonoses, right? So it's the connection with the virus that are coming from animals. So with the way we are transforming our cities, the way we are developing, measuring our success through DDP, which is not really measuring what matters, which is our well-being uh, and health, uh, we are putting ourselves at risk. So we could solve this pandemic, but the next one might come. So um, like I said, I'm, I wasn't, um, I'm passionate about the narrative of planetary health because I think, uh, I, you know, I just wrote this, you don't need to buy the book. So it's just this, the title is important, which is breaking the silos for planetary health and just, I was so tired of going to so many uh, meetings. I worked with biodiversity before, uh, going for this COPS um, for <laughs> years, and we are just communities remain so separate. Uh, even the gender community, by the way, we do gender, so we are talking about domestic sexual, domestic violence, or you know, we're not uh, integrating this conversation. So I think there's one positive thing coming out of this is how. Uh, the biodiversity dimension also in the climate, uh, now we're having you know, nature restoration, having concrete targets here, uh, that will definitely help to protect our health. So that's one uh, very um, obvious link uh, that we have. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Hasanti, what, hap what solutions emerge when we center women's voices within the, con I mean, you've had such an exceptional career and I have this funny feeling you're gonna continue for quite some time. You're just getting started, it seems. You're gonna add quite a few more dimensions to what you've already achieved. You know, what, what, what have you seen in your career that changes when we center women's voices when we're thinking about? Um, I think um, when women speak out, especially, I'll, I'll, not, not, I'll also say uh, for Asia, at least for South Asia, um, you know, there are two sides, like South Asia, there is this uh, tendency of looking down on women. Society uh, in the Indian subcontinent, there is also caste system. In Sri Lanka, it's quite less. Uh, but generally, uh, there is subtle element of uh, not uh, giving prominence to women. But when women speak out, you know, men just don't speak or there is, I mean, uh, the first reaction may be like criticizing, but if they find that there is substance and all that, let's say like in Sri Lanka, for instance, there, was, there is this uh, uh, forest officer, young forest officer, mother of three kids, um, was very vo uh, vociferous on uh, cutting uh, illegal felling of trees, uh, clearing of mangroves overnight by politicians, by business people, uh, by just people. And a lot of people thought that something might have, could have happened to her or she would be transferred or, you know, those things have happened. Especially those things happen to men. But probably because she was a woman, she still continued to do so. And I, I, surprisingly, I find that uh, her male colleagues uh, are so scared to criticize. But I think in that sense, women should take the advantage and do that. In fact, I remember, you know, I think in our societies, uh, there is this aspect, the other aspect, what we are not thinking of. Uh, from personal experience, I can say when I was about, you know, maybe in my 20s, I was going with, in a bus with my boyfriend and the, the, the conductor didn't give me the balance. So I had an argument. And, you know, he, he was refusing to give it. I said, give me the balance. Um, somehow I got the balance to find my boyfriend had got off the bus. 
And I asked her, you abandoned me, why? No, because if I had intervened, I, I would have got beaten up. They wouldn't beat, beat a woman. I knew you would get down at the next stop. So we met halfway and I was annoyed, but that is, that is a fact because, uh, so in Asian cultures, there is this uh, dual standard. So I think women should leverage, <laughs> leverage on it. And uh, sorry men folks who are here, but uh, if there are any Asian men, you know, there is also some sort of a respect for women. Uh, so um, I think, you know, if you can really leverage and uh, do things, uh, you can. And then um, also, uh, uh, just like everywhere else in the world, in Asian communities, when there are times of disasters and all that, women take the greater burden uh, of children and if it is villagers, the household pets and animals, everything uh, are taken care of by the women and men would uh, panic more and would look at maybe if they have a car or a bike or saving that bike <laughs> is the far more concern than everything else. Uh, not everybody, but generally it's like that. So burden on women is quite a lot. So, um, so I think uh, uh, we, t I think if women think to do stuff, it is possible. It is not that uh, it's impossible. You, you have to uh, think that you can do it. And uh, because I find it in my job, because in the government, a lot of people say that you can't change things. But I, I realize that you can really change things if you try. You have to never give up, you know. So I'd like to bring it back a bit to this biodiversity piece and prudence. You mentioned, you know, this sort of, and I have a lot of empathy for this because I, I, I think we could talk about this for quite some time. But, you know, effectively you started off as an elephant organization, or at least that was sort of the founding principle. You know, I, I started off as an orangutan organization and here I am. Um, but, but the relationship between that and the local community. So could you talk a little bit about how that interconnects and how, you're, how the organization has had to really um, think quite broadly. And I guess my point being around how biodiversity really impacts everything that we do. That is very interesting indeed. And um, I'm going to try and tackle it from two different angles. So when I mention Rally Cry, Running Cry Initiative, I'm going to refer to the uh, women business entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and how they are doing their work. And then I'm going to refer to the small holder farmers. So as we started like an elephant institution, um, what we really noticed is um, the only way that these rural communities understood um, to raise income was through poaching, uh, was through um, damaging the environment. And this was their source of income. So what was very key was to identify if they were willing to change and the sad part about it is when these rural communities are involved in poaching, I mean, when you kill an elephant, it's not like that environment is going to eat or feed on the elephant. There is some rich tycoon that is paying for the task and all that. And that's what we needed to tackle. And the greatest thing that we observed is these people love their communities. They love their environment. They love the land that they, ha that, that they own. And we try to identify solutions which could replace the income that they were uh, earning from either poaching or damaging the environment. And damaging the environment, I'm referring to, kill, um, to cutting down of trees. I'll give you an example of uh, when people are involved in uh, cutting down of trees for charcoal generation. An individual will probably get 70 kwacha in Zambian uh, currency for an 80 kg bag, and 70 kwacha is about less than a dollar. The effort that these men and women have to apply just to earn 50 cents, it's ridiculous. But this is what people in the towns and cities don't appreciate, and they don't care. So we engage the communities, made them understand how <laughs> precious the environment is. And from an African setup, the environment is everything. We work through chiefdoms, they love the environment. They attach it to their, um, what we call Ubuntu, their nature. And that's so precious. 
So Community Markets for Conservation came up with alternative methods, started training and teaching uh, the communities on how to practice conservation agriculture. And within that, it involved quite a lot. You provide incentives for the, farmer, uh, for the communities to stop poaching. And with that, each year, year in, year out, we actually see the numbers of wildlife increasing. We are engaging the communities. They themselves have taken the initiative to protect the, the, wild, um, the national parks around them. They themselves have taken the initiatives to protect the trees around them. And that's where it all came from. And the thing that we can emphasize is as long as you can provide solutions to the communities, the people that are most dangerous are the people that are sitting in this room and our colleagues outside, but the people that are living around um, key elements of biodiversity really love and, and, and really cherish the environments around them. So that's, that's, um, that was our initiative. Those are the solutions we brought through. And from the Rallying Cry initiative, we've got so many women that have come from different areas, different sectors, and have appreciated uh, the importance of preserving nature. And these women have been involved in various um, projects. Some are doing strawberry farming in a conservative way. Uh, some are generating organic uh, fertilizers so that we can preserve our soils. It's, it's a lot of different initiatives, and these need to be incentivized when you're working with the communities, and that's the key thing. As long as we can find safe environments, safe options, then we can say our environment is safe, but we need to take that initiative, and we need to respect that. I always say when you're talking about biodiversity, it's as simple as you need water, you need food, and um, the food that you eat, the, the food that you eat, the water that you drink, if you can't preserve or protect nature, then you don't have that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also bring in um, uh, Judy in terms of you know, using the law as a way of protecting biodiversity. And if you could just unpack that a little bit. As some of us have been spending quite a lot of time um, with our colleague at Stop Ecocide International and thinking about ecocide as an international crime, um, but I just think in terms of the work that you're doing, how important it is to protect biodiversity. If you could maybe just tell us about, about some of that. But we apparently have a very limited amount of time left, yeah. and then I do want to come back <laughs> to the land. Uh, yes, okay. Um, on the aspect of law, I'll look at it on two, on two fronts. One is the community, how does the community interact with the law? And how do the lawmakers and the law implementers interact with the law in terms of the connectivity with the society or the communities? Because at the end of the day, it's the community who's supposed to be conserving the environment, conserving the forest, and conserving everything. And if they do not understand the law, and we remember their cultural communities, the indigenous people, they have lived, they have lived with the, with the, with the forest. They have, been, they have lived all their lives cutting down and living with the, uh, with the environment sustainably according to their own customs and according to their practices. Then we come in with our laws and say, we cannot cut trees up to this extent. But they've been doing this every single day. They rely on the bushmeat. They have no other way of, of, of sustaining themselves. And remember, in Africa, it's an issue of food security. So uh, in policy, we always have to think of how we're going to balance the two and see how can we uh, bring the issue of sustainability. Always when it comes to sustainability, we need to come up with a situation where we're able to use whatever we have in a sustainable manner in view of our future generations. And so how the law comes in is us to come and try and come up with a balance. And with this, all it's all about education, awareness. We need to educate the indigenous people, educate us, and how we're going to incorporate them. We have a whole community called Samburu in our country where they live, uh, they live with wildlife. Like you can even walk in the streets, you just see a giraffe moving, or just crossing the road, a zebra. And you'd see how they sustainably live with their wildlife. So how can we, people from another community, come and poach the same giraffes, you see? So we need to learn and bring in all this awareness. And even as we're implementing the laws, we need to come up with a situation where the laws that have been imposed are not too punitive for the normal uh, community. She's talked about the people living in wildlife. They need uh, firewood to just have a small meal, to make a meal. If we impose uh, penalties of if you're caught with firewood, you pay around 10,000 US dollars. They cannot be able to pay that. So how can we create a balance? And that's where policy comes in, 
to make sure that everyone is at par and lives sustainably. So the law comes in to come up and uh, enable us to come up with policies that ensure sustainable living. And with that, if we bring in educational programs that educate the communities and everyone at large, we'll be able to conserve the biodiversity and improve every and empower every community member to improve and protect the biodiversity. Um, so, with, I've been spending a huge amount of time over the last few years working with indigenous communities and one of the things that I've learned is that actually biodiversity is no different from their perspective to who we are as individuals. And so the whole idea of biodiversity in and of itself is actually absurd to, to indigenous communities. Um, and Belen, I was wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about, about that and just the sort of you know, the, the, what can we take from that? You know, I know that we, as dominant Western culture, we need to use these tools like law, like ecocide, all of the financing things that we've been talking about today, looking at refabricating our social structures. But how do we start to approach? What's your advice for us to start to approach a different mindset about how we think about ourselves in relationship to the natural world, again, not separate from nature? This, there is this analysis on biodiversity, the 80% of biodiversity around the world is on indigenous territories. And one of the hotspots, uh, most biodiverse place on Earth is on, on the equators, right in the Amazon region in between Peru and Ecuador. So there are, um, as much biodiversity is in a, in a place, this place was a refugee during the, the um, Age, like, yeah, ice age. So when I was, um, when I'm close to the ceremonies with indigenous peoples in, in the territories, they are always referring to the enormous um, biodiverse of spirits. So every single being in the forest, every single plant, river, insects, they are connected within the, the, the indigenous peoples through their dreams. So what uh, we have found working with indigenous people so for many years is that biodiversity is re related to their spirituality. Okay. And it's related to the call from the spirits from the forest, not for that, just for them, but for the whole world in this moment. So in ceremonies, men and women, especially men, that they are the ones who they sing to the gardens in order to have good um, plants and good uh, harvesting after six months with their manioc, etc. So when they sing the song, they refer to the biodiversity of the spirits on their gardens. So this connectivity is something really special and it's really crucial because they are saying that when the forest is getting in, in this massive destruction, the spirits go away. The biodiversity of the spirits, they are also going away and they are not going to come back. So in order to become a better, um, let's say, uh, in order to have solutions over the next 10 years to protect the forest, we really need to listen to the voice to, from the forest and from the voice from indigenous wisdom and people. Mm, thank you. Well, I would say that's a beautiful way to end this conversation on biodiversity and learning how to reconnect to the natural world and spend time in nature and outside of very white cop pavilions because they're so <laughs> destroying. <laughs> Bring in the green. <laughs> Thank you.